Shoes and Stockings, a collection of short stories by Louisa May Alcott. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Carolyn Francis. A Country Christmas, Part 4, by Louisa May Alcott. Three prettier damsels never tripped down the wide staircase than the brilliant brunette in crimson brocade, the pensive blonde in blue, or the rosy little bride in old muslin and white satin. A gallant court gentleman met them in the hall with a superb bow, and escorted them to the parlor, where Grandma Bassett's ghost was discovered dancing with a modern major in full uniform. Mutual admiration and many compliments followed, till other ancient ladies and gentlemen arrived in all manner of queer costumes, and the old house seemed to wake from its humdrum quietude to sudden music and merriment, as if a past generation had returned to keep its Christmas there. The village fiddler soon struck up the good old tunes, and then the strangers saw dancing that filled them with mingled mirth and envy. It was so droll, yet so hearty. The young men, unusually awkward in their grandfather's knee-breeches, flapping vests, and swallow-tail coats, footed it bravely with the buxom girls, who were the prettier for their quaintness, and danced with such vigor that their high combs stood awry, their fur billows waved wildly, and their cheeks were as red as their breast-knots or hose. It was impossible to stand still, and one after the other the city folk yielded to the spell, Randall leading off with Ruth, Sophie swept away by Saul, and Emily being taken possession of by a young giant of eighteen, who spun her around with a boyish impetuosity that took her breath away. Even Aunt Plummy was discovered jigging it alone in the pantry, as if the music was too much for her, and the plates and glasses jingled gaily on the shelves in time to Monkey Musk and Fisher's Hornpipe. A pause came at last, however, and fans fluttered, heated brows were wiped, jokes were made, lovers exchanged confidences, and every nook and corner held a man and maid carrying on the sweet game which is never out of fashion. There was a glitter of gold lace in the back entry, and a train of blue and primrose shone in the dim light. There was a richer crimson than that of the geraniums in the deep window, and a dainty shoes tapped the bare floor impatiently as the brilliant black eyes looked everywhere for the court gentleman, while their owner listened to the gruff prattle of an enamored boy. But in the upper hall walked a little white ghost, as if waiting for some shadowy companion, and when a dark form appeared, ran to take its arm, saying in a tone of soft satisfaction, "'I was so afraid you wouldn't come!' "'Why did you leave me, Ruth?' answered a manly voice in a tone of surprise, though the small hand slipping from the velvet coat-sleeve was replaced, as if it was pleasant to feel it there. A pause, and then the other voice answered demurely, "'Because I was afraid my head would be turned by the fine things you were saying.' "'It is impossible to help saying what one feels to such an artless little creature as you are. "'It does me good to admire anything so fresh and sweet, and won't harm you.' "'It might, if—' "'If what, my Daisy?' "'I believed it.' "'And a laugh seemed to finish the broken sentence better than the words. "'You may, Ruth.' for I do sincerely admire the most genuine girl I have seen for a long time, and walking here with you in your bridal white, I was just asking myself if I should not be a happier man, with a home of my own, 
and a little wife hanging on my arm, than drifting about the world as I do now, with only myself to care for. I know you would! And Ruth spoke so earnestly that Randall was both touched and startled, fearing he had ventured too far in a mood of unwanted sentiment, born of the romance of the hour and the sweet frankness of his companion. "'Then you don't think it would be rash for some sweet woman to take me in hand and make me happy, since fame is a failure?' "'Oh, no! It would be easy work if she loved you. I know someone, if I only dared to tell her name.' "'Upon my soul, this is cool!' And Randall looked down, wondering if the audacious lady on his arm could be shy Ruth. If he had seen the malicious merriment in her eyes, he would have been more humiliated still. But they were modestly averted, and the face under the little hat was full of a soft agitation, rather dangerous even to a man of the world." She is a captivating little creature, but it is too soon for anything but a mild flirtation. I must delay further innocent revelations, or I shall do something rash. While making this excellent resolution, Randall had been pressing the hand upon his arm and gently pacing down the dimly lighted hall with the sound of music in his ears. Ruth's sweetest roses in his buttonhole, and a loving little girl beside him, as he thought. "'You shall tell me by and by when we are in town. I am sure you will come, and meanwhile don't forget me.' "'I'm going in the spring, but I shall not be with Sophie,' answered Ruth in a whisper. "'With whom, then? I shall long to see you. With my husband. I am to be married in May. The deuce you are, escaped Randall, as he stopped short to stare at his companion, sure she was not in earnest. But she was, for as he looked, the sound of steps coming up the back stairs made her whole face flush and brighten with the unmistakable glow of happy love and she completed Randall's astonishment by running into the arms of the young minister, saying with an irrepressible laugh, "'Oh, John, why didn't you come before?' The court gentleman was all right in a moment, and the coolest of the three as he offered his congratulations and gracefully retired, leaving the lovers to enjoy the tryst he had delayed. But as he went downstairs, his brows were knit, and he slapped the broad railing smartly with his cocked hat, as if some irritation must find vent in a more energetic way than merely saying, "'Confound the little baggage!' under his breath. Such an amazing supper came from Aunt Plummy's big pantry that the city guests could not eat for laughing at the queer dishes circulating through the rooms, and copiously partaken of by the hearty young folks. Donuts and cheese, pie and pickles, cider and tea, baked beans and custards, cake and cold turkey, bread and butter, plum pudding and French bonbons. Sophie's contribution. May I offer you the native delicacies and share your plate? Both are very good, but the china has run short, and after such vigorous exercise as you have had, you must need refreshment. I'm sure I do, said Randall, bowing before Emily with a great blue platter laden with two doughnuts, two wedges of pumpkin pie, and two spoons. The smile with which she welcomed him, the alacrity with which she made room beside her, and seemed to enjoy the supper he brought, was so soothing to his ruffled spirit that he soon began to feel that there is no friend like an old friend, that it would not be difficult to name a sweet woman who would take him in hand and would make him happy if he cared to ask her, 
and he began to think he would by and by. It was so pleasant to sit in that green corner with waves of crimson brocade flowing over his feet and a fine face softening beautifully under his eyes. The supper was not romantic, but the situation was, and Emily found that pie ambrosial food eaten with the man she loved, whose eyes talked more eloquently than the tongue, just then busy with a doughnut. Ruth kept away, but glanced at them as she served her company, and her own happy experience helped her to see that all was going well in that quarter. Saul and Sophie emerged from the back entry with shining countenances, but carefully avoided each other for the rest of the evening. No one observed this but Aunt Plummy from the recesses of her pantry, and she folded her hands as if well content, as she murmured fervently over a pan full of crullers, Bless the dears, now I can die happy. Everyone thought Sophie's old-fashioned dress immensely becoming, and several of his former men said to Saul with blunt admiration, Major, you look tonight as you used to after we'd gained a big battle. I feel as if I had, answered the splendid Major, with eyes much brighter than his buttons, and a heart under them infinitely prouder than when he was promoted on the field of honor, for his Waterloo was won. There was more dancing, followed by games, in which Aunt Plummy shone preeminent, for the supper was off her mind, and she could enjoy herself. There were shouts of merriment as the blithe old lady twirled the platter, hunted the squirrel, and went to Jerusalem like a girl of sixteen. Her cap in a ruinous condition, and every seam of the purple dress straining like sails in a gale. It was great fun, but at midnight it came to an end, and the young folks, still bubbling over with innocent jollity, went jingling away along the snowy hills, unanimously pronouncing Mrs. Bassett's party the best of the season. "'Never had such a good time in my life!' exclaimed Sophie, as the family stood together in the kitchen where the candles among the wreaths were going out, and the floor was strewn with wrecks of past joy. "'I'm proper glad, dear. Now you all go to bed, and lay as late as you like tomorrow. I'm so kinder worked up I couldn't sleep. So Saul and me will put things to rights without a mite of noise to disturb you. And Aunt Plummy sent them off with a smile that was a benediction, Sophie thought. That dear old soul speaks as if midnight was an unheard of hour for Christians to be up. What would she say if she knew how we seldom go to bed till dawn in the ball season? I'm so wide awake, I've half a mind to pack a little. Randall must go at two, he says, and we shall want his escort, said Emily, as the girls laid away their brocades in the press in Sophie's room. I'm not going. Aunt can't spare me, and there is nothing to go for yet, answered Sophie beginning to take the white chrysanthemums out of her pretty hair. "'My dear child, you will die of ennui up here. Very nice for a week or so, but frightful for a winter. We are going to be very gay, and cannot get on without you,' cried Emily, dismayed at the suggestion. "'You will have to, for I am not coming. I am very happy here.' and so tired of the frivolous life I lead in town, that I have decided to try a better one. And Sophie's mirror reflected a face full of the sweetest content. Have you lost your mind? Experienced religion? Or any other dreadful thing? You always were odd, but this last freak is the strangest of all. What will your guardians say, and the world? 
added Emily, in the awe-stricken tone of one who stood in fear of the omnipotent Mrs. Grundy. "'Guardy will be glad to be rid of me, and I don't care that for the world,' cried Sophie, snapping her fingers with a joyful sort of recklessness which completed Emily's bewilderment. "'But, Mr. Hammond, are you going to throw away millions?' "'Lose your chance of making the best match in the city "'and driving the girls of our set out of their wits with envy?' "'Sophie laughed at her friend's despairing cry "'and turning round said quietly, "'I wrote to Mr. Hammond last night "'and this evening received my reward for being an honest girl. "'Saul and I are to be married in the spring when Ruth is.' Emily fell prone upon the bed, as if the announcement was too much for her, but was up again in an instant to declare with prophetic solemnity, "'I knew something was going on, but hoped to get you away before you were lost. Sophie, you will repent. Be warned and forget this sad delusion.' "'Too late for that.' The pang I suffered yesterday when I thought Saul was dead showed me how well I loved him. Tonight he asked me to stay, and no power in the world can part us. Oh, Emily, it is all so sweet, so beautiful, that everything is possible, and I know I shall be happy in this dear old home, full of love and peace and honest hearts. I only hope you may find as true and tender a man to live for as my Saul. Sophie's face was more eloquent than her fervent words, and Emily beautifully illustrated the inconsistency of her sex by suddenly embracing her friend with the incoherent exclamation, I think I have, dear. Your brave Saul is worth a dozen old Hamans. "'And I do believe you are right.' "'It is unnecessary to tell how, "'as if drawn by the irresistible magic of sympathy, "'Ruth and her mother crept in one by one "'to join the midnight conference "'and add their smiles and tears, "'tender hopes and proud delight "'to the joys of that memorable hour. "'Nor how Saul, unable to sleep, mounted guard below, and meeting Randall prowling down to soothe his nerves with a surreptitious cigar, found it impossible to help confiding to his attentive ear the happiness that would break bounds and overflow in unusual eloquence. Peace fell upon the old house at last and all slept as if some magic herb had touched their eyelids, bringing blissful dreams and a glad awakening. "'Can't we persuade you to come with us, Miss Sophie?' asked Randall next day, as they made their adieu. "'I'm under orders now, and dare not disobey my superior officer,' answered Sophie, handing her major his driving gloves with a look which plainly showed that she had joined the great army of devoted women who enlist for life and ask no pay but love. "'I shall depend on being invited to your wedding, then, and yours, too, Miss Ruth,' added Randall, shaking hands with the little baggage, as if he had quite forgiven her mockery and forgotten his own brief lapse into sentiment. Before she could reply, Aunt Plummy said, in a tone of calm conviction that made them all laugh, and some of them look conscience, "'Spring is a good time for weddings, and I shouldn't wonder if there was quite a number.' "'Nor I,' and Saul and Sophie smiled at one another as they saw how carefully Randall arranged Emily's wraps." Then, with kisses, thanks, and all the good wishes that happy hearts could imagine, the guests drove away, 
to remember long and gratefully that pleasant country Christmas. End of Part 4 End of A Country Christmas by Louisa May Alcott